Welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, China's Conference through Yu Xiaobo. Um, and our guest is a figure well known to think tech viewers, a fellow host, Asia expert with 25 years of uh, experience in Asia, Ray Tsuchiyama. Great to be here. Great to have you, uh, because I'm sure that we'll all benefit from your insight. Before we get to the show, we'd like to take just a minute or so to offer our condolences to the, um, the survivors of Professor William Theodore de Barry, one of America's preeminent experts on uh, Asia, um, Professor Emeritus, Provost Emeritus of Columbia University. His scholarship certainly benefited everyone, just not Columbia University students, but students regardless of which university they might have been studying in, be it in the United States, Europe, Asia, or wherever. He certainly opened many of our eyes to the foundations of Chinese and Japanese civilization. So again, our condolences go to the DeBarry family. Liu Xiaobo, wow, what a figure. Um, nominated for the Nobel Prize in 2010 by the likes of the Dalai Lama, Bishop Tutu of South Africa, uh, and of course unable to accept it because he was incarcerated in China. The author of the Charter 08, which really struck at the whole foundations of the People's Republic of China. Um, what's your take on Liu Xiaobo? He's a man of, of uh, the post-cultural revolution. I would see him uh, as one of those who kind of well, that's a great way to yeah, put it. Yeah, and and um, he came of age during Tiananmen Square, 1989. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, but. The thing that really distinguishes him, and he has a literature background. Mm -hmm. He wrote many, many uh, uh, critiques of modern and traditional Chinese literature. Mm -hmm. So he has a research background. Right. He comes from the north, northeast, and even today people talk about his rough Jilin accent. <laughs> He's not a you know a bourgeois uh, or or aristocratic Beijing or you know right, of that right. of that class, and he remained in China after Tiananmen Square. That, right. is, uh, that distinguishes him again uh, among many student leaders who left China and went abroad to Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, or Berkeley, or London. They left. Wu or Kai Xi, yeah, Kai Lin. Yeah, they're very famous uh, right. people. Uh, but he remained. And he um, continued to work in the literary field, but yet he expanded and became not uh, more like uh, Andrei Sokolov, in mm -hmm. a sense, of Russia, who identified uh, political kinds of um, uh, areas where China should uh, become more like the West, introducing uh, the 08 uh, document is remarkable because it is a focus on a new constitution, right. independent judiciary, elections, uh, human rights, um, religious freedom, the hallmarks of but a can democracy. I add a couple things? Oh, go ahead. This, this really strikes at the heart of the People's Republic of China. He wanted to privatize land, and he wanted to privatize state-owned enterprises, which really gets to uh, some of the, um, some of, some of, in today's world, some of Xi Jinping's strongest supporters who run the, right. or have control yeah. over the SOE. Who want to continue state enterprises. Right. <laughs> right. Because yeah. of, for their own economic right. benefit. Right, even though they're bleeding and are, they're bleeding. And are a hindrance to economic growth. Uh, uh, well, that's an excellent yeah. point. Yeah. I, I quite agree with you. The SOEs are a, an encumbrance to future Chinese economic development. Uh, and, and also, uh, obviously, decentralization of right. the economy. Yeah. And, but one of the things about China is that uh, uh, how they grew with small enterprises. When you look at China today, there's a lot of private enterprises. It's because of the great leap forward. People look back and say, oh, the communists are a bad uh, thing. With, with, uh, you know, every commune should have their steel mill, you know, <laughs> their own uh, manufacturing, <laughs> their own you know, consumer electronics. Well, when, when things got liberalized, there were a, f a whole you know, uh, a huge uh, you know, number of these uh, firms uh, mm -hmm. became privatized and, and uh, into uh, uh, business, unlike Russia and India, where they relied on large state enterprises for a long time. Yeah. Right, right. Well, it, it's interesting. Today we're talking about Liu Xiaobo. We've also, uh, you know, extended our condolences to Theodore, uh, William Theodore de Barry. These are two really inspirational people. Um, 
And as you said, uh, Leo Xiaobo remained behind. Uh, right. He didn't run. Right. Uh, Fang Lijie, another big dissident figure, he left. Wang, um, uh, let me see, I got to give his name. Um, Wei Jinxiang, uh, the leader of the democracy wall right. movement, he left ostensibly for medical reasons. I don't know how true that, that might have might or might not have been. But Liu Xiaobo remained behind. He really did pay the price, didn't he? And he, among the dissidents, um, also critiqued other dissidents uh, right. <laughs> in a way. He was uh, called Heima, or you know, a black horse, an unusual horse, okay. uh, kind of uh, uh, cr uh, critic in his own right. So he was uh, what we would call a very individualist uh, character within, <laughs> within China. Now, this is really yeah. interesting that you mentioned this, and I'm glad that you got up on this track. Now, I, I haven't really met any Chinese dissidents from mainland China, but I met a host of um, so-called dissidents in Taiwan. These right. are people who got stuck in prison, sentenced to prison for their participation in the uh, Taiwan independence movement and that sort of thing. And they all are very independent. It's, I think, hard for them to work for other people. And, right. and, and the truth of the matter is, well, you say he critiqued other dissidents. There's a lot of animosity between dissidents, because they're all, I think, striving for fame. It's less like, sort of like, uh, there, was, there was competition between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. And, and so, uh, um, while in one hand, uh, uh, not to speak ill of Liu Xiaobo, or other dissidents, but there is this phenomenon about like they want to uh, be at the top of the, how, how should we say, outshine others, yeah. And, and, and I've heard some really sarcastic, nasty comments in Taiwan, without mentioning names, about people who were in jail, political prison for participation in Taiwan independence movement, but other people had a, shared a similar fate and uh, I think it's kind of a shame because they're all working for the same goal. Uh, well, you're correct. And in other countries, um, in reconciliation, mm -hmm. uh, after a very uh, divisive struggle of many years, mm -hmm. and you can point to one man uh, who outshines uh, us all, Nelson Mandela. Uh -huh. for, for example, right. and uh, he tried to, uh, uh, you know, uh, say the past is the past, but let's move on and get everybody right. working together right. for the future of South Africa. And he did a tr tremendous job, except that South Africa has not uh, uh, seen, you know, a, really a stable uh, economy and political time uh, right now. Right. But he did try very hard to, uh, to uh, get people together. Now, but going back to your point. I think you know the reason why there's been a lot of uh, spotlight, media spotlight on uh, Liu Xiaobo is that there aren't too many people that we can identify who are speaking against the government right. uh, within China or even right. outside China. Usually uh, for the media, they go to Ai Weiwei, the artist mm -hmm. living in mm -hmm. Paris mm -hmm. or in London or other places, and uh, you get a kind of a artistic uh, kind of a response. Or, but he he has spoken out on say the uh, number of the truly uh, injured and, and, and uh, uh, people who died during the Sichuan right, earthquake, for right, example. Right. And there are people trying to say that the government must be more transparent right. with its own people. Right. And I think that's what uh, really uh, hurts me a lot about the Ch Chinese government, that it doesn't trust its own people uh, to really uh, enjoy full human rights, uh, you know, in the long term. Well, I, I you know, I had a, I had a couple of reactions. See, I'm going to play devil's advocate here for a minute or two. Okay. Uh, I, I think, uh, well, maybe my first comment is not so much into the, in, in the camp of devil's advocate, but it, it does seem that, you know, once dissidents leave China, uh, they're very prominent in the media for a short period of time in the United States or Western Europe, but after that, they sort of fade away. Right. Um, and, and I, I think the other thing is, too, um, is as China's economic clout grows in the world, it seems other countries are not as prone to uh, hold China's feet to the fire on human rights because they're all afraid that it's going to undercut their financial economic relationship with China. And, and, you know, and it does seem to me, too, um, it's been said of Liu Xiaobo that he romanticized Western civilization. He really didn't understand it as thoroughly as perhaps he thought he did. So 
Yeah, I just offer another side of the story. Well, for the silent majority in China, they've enjoyed great economic uh, wealth right. <laughs> right, <laughs> so right, for the right, last right, right. 30, 40 years, ever since Deng Xiaoping, you know, um, uh, and, and looking at Pudong and, and right. bringing that up and Shenzhen and the, you know, right, right, uh, right, the flowering right. of uh, small enterprises and privatization. Now, since the, uh, you know, after Tiananmen Square into the 90s and 2000s, uh, the whole economic, um, you know, uh, uh, the middle class have emerged. Uh, mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely right. Now, and you're correct that for well, many of my friends in China, uh, we have this argument all the time. They would say, oh, economics first, politics second right 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 and so um, the fact that the, you have you can't vote for the mayor of beijing or mayor of a village okay. <laughs> at all and they're appointed by the, the communist right. party there's only one party right. uh, so, so isn't that strange you know can't you have other parties and uh, no they just don't go into that so I, I think you're correct on the domestic area i that that is still um, uh, true uh, for for many people uh, however having said that the outpouring of messaging in WeChat mm -hmm. about the death of Liu Xiaobo has been outstanding. Wow. And, right. and, and the censorship, uh, Tencent, uh, Sina, Baidu, uh -huh. you know, other uh, internet web, uh, you know, um, web engines and so forth, have been tremendous. So uh, the, the government really uh, is afraid of, of more, uh, you know, uh, outpouring of any kind of recognition I, about I, this person. I would agree with that, and I think the reason they he was his ashes were scattered at sea is because they did not want any monuments built to his memory where they could create, you know, opportunities for pilgrimages for for followers of Liu Xiaobo. On the other side of the coin here, trying to see this right. on both sides as hard as it might be <laughs> at times. Um, it, it does seem to me, I remember this conversation I had, in, when I go to China, I'm usually very busy running from one appointment to another, right. so I spend a lot of time in taxi cabs because right. they know where they're going and <laughs> I don't. <laughs> and you get into the talks, these long chit chats right. with taxi cab drivers, and I remember this one ride. This guy was complaining about the government mm -hmm. left and right for 30 or 35 <laughs> minutes. And then he goes, but you know, we have more freedom now than right. we ever had. And you know, when I think about that, I, I think there's truth to that. I mean, when did China ever have really much freedom? And yeah, okay, things are not at a so-called Western standard, but by China's standard, it's come a long way. Well, you're correct, but so we say that China, we're giving them this level for uh, so that uh, beyond this level, there won't be any Christian churches or, uh, you know, Buddhist temples or Taoists. They they can't uh, be free to, you know, uh, to. Uh, this is Xi Jinping's. To, yeah, uh, to to uh, carry Bibles. Yeah, carry Bibles, <laughs> or for uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhists to, you know, to run their own uh, monasteries. So you got to be very. Um, uh, careful when you say that. So uh, in America or the West, we have, or in Japan, we have this type of uh, level. In China, well, they have a great. Right, I'm being told we need to take a break. Okay. Let's hold it right, right. right there. We're going to come back and pick up this point in just a minute. <laughs> uh, you're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is well known Ray Tsuchiyama. And we're having a very lively, vibrant conversation about Liu Xiaobo. So do not go away because <laughs> we'll be right back and we promise to be equally as vibrant. You can be the greatest, you can be the best You can be the king, come banging on your chest You can beat the world, you can beat the war You can talk to God, go banging on his door You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock You can move a mountain, you can break rocks You can be a master, don't wait for luck Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself
Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today, The, Conscien the Conscience of China, Liu Xiaobo. My guest, well-known Ray Tsujiyama, uh, fellow think tech host, uh, Asia expert with 25-plus uh, years of experience in Asia. And we were having a very lively discussion about Liu Xiaobo. Uh, during the break, Ray brought up a really important point, that uh, something that uh, Liu Xiaobo stood for, emphasized, that China's ultranationalism. Well, I'll let you pick up the thought. Yeah, well, he was, um, in his writings, a ardent um, uh, writer on the evils of ultranationalism mm -hmm. in China, that he thought that um, by using this uh, in the society, it will lead ultimately to a bad a negative end for China. So. Um, he wanted to have people think about other things rather than, you know, this, this ultra-nationalist trend that was sweeping the society. You know, it, it seems to me, um, like we were talking about the other break, ultra-nationalism, according to Liu Xiaobo, leads to autocratic rule. You know, I, I think I'd go a step further and say it also creates the preconditions for corruption especially in societies where traditionally um, criticism of the leadership has been a big taboo, um, I, I, as such is the case in most Asian societies. So ultranationalism really ushers in a lot of problems. I, I think the, the government, of course, wants it, it seems to me, especially in China's case, because given China's history of being a very fissiparous entity and more of a culture than a country in some people's minds, that anything that enhances uh, unity, as the Chinese say, tuanjian, so solidarity, is, is to be promoted. And ultranationalism will do that. But it definitely has some downsides, too. And, and uh, again, w why can't China take the lead in drawing people, countries together in the South China Seas to discuss this issue mm. of uh, the line that they've uh, created in the maps and all kinds of, and it's uh, dialogue and, and with, uh, with a multilateral approach. And now they're pursuing bilateral approaches with each country. And, you know, I, think, I wonder if there's a difference there between ultranationalism and ethno-nationalism. Hmm. The two are part and parcel of each other, I guess. But it, it is true. China always has a kind of a superiority complex. Well, uh, from uh, remember from the Ming Dynasty uh, and into the Qing Dynasty, uh, you know, uh, uh, when the British came, well, uh, there was nothing for China to buy from the rest of the world because China had everything. Right, right, right. <laughs> remember, <laughs> take your opium and your manufactured goods back to England. Uh, but you're, <laughs> you're 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 correct though. But, but the late 19 from the late 19th century, of course, uh, at the end of the uh, Qing Dynasty. The, uh, uh, the uh, colonial imperialist powers and the carving up of China, they, they always go back as China's victim right. and, and, and the destruction of China, the warlords and so forth. And, and so that, that That's is, a really yeah. good point yes. because China certainly plays up that victimization. We are victims. But I think a lot of Asian societies do that too. Uh, and that's not China, but maybe China has it, plays the card a little bit better than other countries. Um, well, I'd like to move on. Uh, one more point before we move on to Hong Kong, uh, 20 years after. Right. What's Liu Xiaobo's legacy? I think that uh, in the West, um, there's always going to be people uh, who look at um, this dissident as promoting democracy, uh, human rights in China. Mm -hmm. But in the long term, uh, in, uh, I, I don't think that his legacy uh, under the current government will endure. It's going to be really tough for that. Uh, uh, it's not going to be taught in schools. It's not going to be in the media. It's expunged. You can't even look up uh, uh, his, his name in I, I um, right. the Internet. So I think, right. I, I think it's going to be very challenging for uh, that legacy and for younger people to uh, continue that uh, struggle or mm -hmm. continue his writings or continue his charter and so forth. So uh, it's, it's very difficult to be a dissident in, in China. It really is. It's especially hard. I mean, there's so much, the security in China is so tight. I mean, just to get on the subway, you have to go through security. And when you go to places like Tibet, the security is 
a hundred times more um, complex, a hundred times more complete. Well, let's move on to Hong Kong. Um, just recently, Hong Kong celebrated its 20 years of revision to uh, reversion to China. Um, it was uh, striking to me that um, Xi Jinping, during his visit, his first official visit to Hong Kong as uh, chairman, made a big thing about visiting the military troops, reviewing the troops. And the troops used to be fairly, uh, f fairly frequently rotated in and out of Hong Kong. Now they're pretty much a standard feature. Um, I don't know. That's one thing that stuck out to me. But um, what, what's your take on, Thai on Taiwan, Hong Kong, 20 years later? Well, let's look at the economy. OK. Uh, and uh, the uh, economy has, I think, uh, suffered. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the financial services are still there, uh -huh. uh, but a lot have uh, gone to uh, Shanghai. Right. Uh, yeah. There's uh, the buildup of so much manufacturing, financial services, um, uh, new companies and businesses on the mainland. Right. It's, uh, that, that has taken uh, uh, much of Hong Kong as a middleman kind of uh, figure. However, uh, there's um, Hong Kong also as a place to live for the people of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there's for the, for the majority of Hong Kong people, I think it's uh, business as usual. There's no, not much change. I, I think that's a good way. Yeah. Uh, the beginning of, uh, from 97 onwards, was the influx of Chinese mainland tourists. Right. I mean, they, they made a huge impact buying up things because right. they knew it wasn't counterfeit. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So, and there was a big buildup. As as you know, and middle class in China wanted you right. know cameras, wanted all kinds of uh, fashions, all, all kinds of electronics goods that they could, could get in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So that happened. Uh, there's a lot more people living from the mainland in Hong Kong that they didn't, uh, I think, expect, and mm -hmm. they're doing business and so forth. There's fewer expatriates, I think, in Hong Kong. I uh, think uh, that's probably yeah. true. Uh, uh, far le a fewer number uh, right. than I before, think that's probably the, true. and uh, because there's a large number working for the British colonial government, uh, in the police, in you know, finance, okay. and so forth. They're, they're no longer there. Um, I, I, I guess the big concerns, you, you know, I, this is a, in a way, uh, we have five minutes left, I've just been told, and so much to talk about. Um, it, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to balance things out. Now, okay, Hong Kong was a British crown colony, and that's not exactly the bedrock of democracy, uh, but there was substantial press freedom. Um, right. the, the court system was held up as a model. And these um, freedoms, um, privileges, however you want to label them, are being sort of chipped away at. Um, yeah, there's some kind of election. Some people call it sham. It's not based on universal, uh, um, universal ballot. But as far as I can recall, it supersedes anything the British had to offer. And um, it, you know, on the other hand, it does seem that there is this kind of, um, I don't know what you would call it, animus amongst top leaders in China about Hong Kong. And they, 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 they really want to build up Shanghai to the kind of the financial center. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right. detriment of yeah. Hong Kong. It, it, it could be some of the attitudes in Hong Kong. Some of the attitudes in Hong Kong towards people in the mainland are not very nice. They sort of look down at them. Well, there's several layers. Really no, but no, there's several layers going on uh, here. Um, that Hong Kong, um, uh, from the very beginning, was a Guangdonghua, you know, Cantonese-speaking right, 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 uh, right, right. region, right. and that uh, Beijing was very much put on wa, you know, uh, uh, Mandarin-focused uh, country. And in fact, even today, they're focusing on uh, even in the south and west to become Mandarin speaking. That's right, number one. Right. Number two. Not a popular move. No. <laughs> no, no <laughs> with, number two. With people who are yeah. Cantonese speakers. Right. But remember 1997, uh, the big uh, uh, slogan was two systems, one country. Right? Two minutes, right. And then that would continue on and on for a thousand years. Right. Now, uh, that, that is uh, still uh, there, but I think the uh, uh, Beijing wa government wants to see Hong Kong really have image of being part of the mainland. You know, that's a really good point. I think the foundation for that, uh, you know, the agreements that were signed, were negotiated at right. the time that they reverted, right. or the, the foundations are kind of shaky right now. And, you know, they're beginning to get lines coming out of Beijing. Well, that's all obsolete now. That's, you know, 20 years later. That doesn't really have the relevance that at one time did. 
But I agree with you. I think, I think Macau, I think Hong Kong are kind of going to disappear after a certain period of time, and they're going to become amalgamated into what you might call um, the greater uh, Pearl River Delta region or something like that. I don't think that they'll be amalgamated with Guangdong province, because then that would make Guangdong province extremely powerful. And, and as you suggested, I don't think Beijing no. really wants that. And, um, but, but I think Hong Kong, I think Macau are slowly over the period of time, they're going to lose their identities and they're going to be rolled into the, to, to the, to the greater Pearl River Delta region or they might call it something like uh, autonomous region, which means nothing. Um, <laughs> well, last 20 years, many people uh, left Hong Kong and gotten Canadian, Australian or UK passports and come back. Right, they're right, they're right, still right, working right. there. Uh, many families are living in Vancouver or right. Sydney or, or Singapore, et cetera. Uh, so they have a way out if right, that right. happens. But still, there's still a tremendous amount of business, still a, a tremendous uh, you know, film, media you know, excitement in Hong Kong that's nowhere else in China. <laughs> I, have to, I just can't hold back. I have to get into a sarcastic comment. Um, I wonder what passport Li Ka Singh has. This guy that really kind of sucks up to Beijing. I <laughs> imagine he's got a Canadian passport, maybe an Australian one. Maybe an American, maybe one of each. <laughs> and, but he's certainly not the only person there. Uh, the so-called patriotic capitalists, they're always, you have to be really cautious with these guys. Um, yeah, um, I, I think that what's going on in Hong Kong is really a bad advertisement uh, in terms of if Beijing ever really wants to unify with Taiwan because this, this you know, uh, one country, two systems idea has never been popular in Taiwan. And as people see the umbrella movement unfold and things that go on in Hong Kong and greater power being exerted by Beijing, yes. the, 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 uh, the Carrie Lam, who was just so-called right. elected as the administrator of Hong Kong, I mean, she, she's just the Beijing puppet in my view. Well, ironically, during the last 20 years, I think there's, among young people in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. a Hong Kong identity that never was really there has flourished, uh, even uh, dramatically. I and think it, that's and, a really and, good point. And, and also young people in Taiwan. Oh, and, and that's th really true. And that's cut away from the Japanese colonial period, right. cut away from the Kuomintang period. Right. And Absolutely. it's a new Taiwan right. uh, for young people that is quite separate and quite exciting in its own uh, world. Ray, we got about 10 seconds okay. left here. What's your parting thought? Well, I think uh, this area of the, um, uh, of the world still requires a lot of focus by America. And we still have to continue teaching, learning, educating, and, and research uh, uh, by Americans. Great, great. Well, you've been watching Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today has been Ray Tsuchiyama. Ray has given us a lot to think about. He's extremely well-informed, very incisive. And uh, I'm sure we've all benefited from his uh, joining us here today. I um, want to thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next week. My guest next week will be Miss Natalie Tso. Uh, Natalie is a host for Radio Taiwan International, which is Taiwan's equivalent to Voice of America. And I'm sure you'll enjoy uh, her visit with us. So we'll see you then.